Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Mejia. I'm a division director at uh, the United Nations Agency for Training and Research, UNITAR. And I welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on the coronavirus pandemic crisis and cybersecurity. <laughs> I'm very pleased to um, have an impressive array of uh, speakers. Uh, our personal appreciation to all of them for taking the time uh, to share their knowledge and experience uh, today and uh, particularly to the Global Cyber Alliance and to the Organization of American States, uh, two organizations that have uh, joined forces with UNITAR to bring this uh, webinar to all of you. The objective is uh, rather simple, is uh, to have a conversation on how cybersecurity remains a top priority, uh, both for institutions and individuals during the COVID times. Um, it's, uh, it's very sad and you're going to hear from uh, experts um, that the cyber attacks, uh, <clears throat> instead of decreasing during a humanitarian crisis of this magnitude, are actually increasing. Uh, but sometimes that is uh, unfortunately human nature. But on a more um, a positive uh, note, I would like to also share with you that um, there are several um, uh, tools, uh, several experiences, best practices that you're going to hear today that hopefully will empower you or your institutions uh, to do better, to protect yourself better and to, and to be resilient when something like this happens. But without further ado, uh, I have been tasked uh, with the responsibility of perhaps painting a um, general view on how the coronavirus pandemic has evolved. And I will attempt to do that uh, very soon and to the point um, in a presentation that you can see right now. Thank you, Julia. So, uh, you will remember that we began um, with a few countries uh, in East Asia, uh, basically affected by uh, the time, um, was an unknown virus. This is the, the end of last year, the beginning of this year, 2020. However, as of today, uh, it, it is the whole world. There are 193 member states of the United uh, uh, Nations, uh, all of them, with no exception, plus what we call territories, which are sovereign in, in, in themselves, uh, also are infected. So the map um, basically should be all red, uh, but we don't want to scandalize anything. So we simply have these red dots uh, marking um, the number of uh, infections. I'm going to get to them soon. And then these uh, green dots, which are important also to call attention to, which are the recovery, uh, number of recoveries, and then the white dots, which are the very sad reality of very many people dying. Next, please. <clears throat> in this um, slide, you see, uh, this is shocking every time that I see that, um, excuse me for this uh, personal comment, that in uh, around seven weeks uh, from the 15th of March, when we had 169 uh, total confirmed cases, to yesterday, we had 3.6, almost 3.7 million people uh, that have been infected with the coronavirus. And then next to that, you see, uh, indeed, the number of um, people that have lost their lives. We went from 6,500 to 257,000 plus um, uh, as of yesterday. Very sad, indeed. Next, please. <clears throat> in this slide, and by the way, apologies if there is a, a small delay with what you see on the screen and what I say because of communication um, and distance. But basically, we want to illustrate here that in the month of April, and what has already transcurred May, the uh, growth of uh, the number of cases has been exponential. And there you see the graph uh, to the left that explains by itself. But to the right, you see um, the number of cases globally per day. So not to lose perspective on, on this crisis, because um, more and more we get to hear government officials, but also uh, people, uh, just citizens, putting pressure on um, an understanding that the crisis is perhaps behind us and that we should go back to normal because, uh, which is fully understandable, the economy is suffering uh, behind um, all these numbers. The lockdowns, and we will get to that very soon, do have an economic and social impact. But uh, as of yesterday, 86,000 people in one day have been infected. Next, please. In this uh, slide, uh, you see uh, to the right a, a table with a short comparison between COVID and other uh, diseases. And COVID is not the most infectious, is not the one that kills the most, but is the one that is easier to transmit uh, comparable to the flu. However, to the left, 
you see that it's 1.5 to two times uh, higher in reproduction as compared to the flu, that 17% of the cases are severe, they require oxygen, that 5% of the cases are actually critical, requiring ventilation, and that um, of those, four to five percent of the people actually die. Uh, and that is uh, rather sad. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here, uh, you will also see uh, the curve um, uh, linear, of course, for independent for each country, in which the United States, unfortunately, it's very much um, separated from the rest of the world, and particularly Europe, which has been um, suffering for the pandemic for two and a half months now with one and a half months of lockdowns. The magnitude of what is happening in the United States and particularly in the region of New England and particularly New York City, it's uh, indeed uh, astronomical when you get to the numbers. And our uh, thoughts and prayers go to our um, <clears throat> colleagues and friends and um, to whoever actually live in that big metropolis because indeed uh, in New York, uh, the human um, uh, reaction and the dramas and the stories that we get to hear through the news are uh, very dramatic, and uh, you can see here why. However, if you go see the other um, the curves, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, the UK, Germany, and so on, uh, it seems that indeed the pandemic is flattening down in number of infections, but still the number of people infected every day and the death every day, as I say, is high. Next, please. So uh, from uh, total confirmed deaths um, uh, and this previous analysis uh, on the total uh, confirmed infected um, uh, people, we um, have extrapolated, and it's not only us, uh, the United Nations, of course, is very many institutions. The one that motivated us to do the first um, two months ago was McKinsey, the, the global uh, consultancy company, to try to analyze what will be possible scenarios ahead. And common sense dictates that there could be two. There could be many, but mainly two. A short recovery and a prolonged, delayed recovery. In the short recovery, the experts have post postulated that the virus continues to spread across the Americas, uh, Europe and Africa, Africa a little less, until the, the end of uh, the second quarter, the end of June, um, when virus seasonality uh, combined with a strong public health response drives the caseload reduction, it drives it down. However, as of now, uh, we haven't been able to establish, our colleagues at WHO here also in Geneva and Switzerland, um, are a, a little cautious when the, in this scenario because the uh, seasonality of the virus uh, is still not confirmed. Uh, there are studies that say that uh, the higher temperatures, uh, the, the virus is uh, less prevalent. There are studies that say just uh, one, uh, two days ago in the US, that if the virus is exposed um, to not only warmer temperatures, but to the sunlight, the virus um, uh, dies and so on. But um, this is uh, something that as you see to the right, and I'm not going to read it, it leads to an epidemiological scenario that is uh, still complicated because we really don't have all the signs behind COVID-19. Next, please. In a short recovery scenario, uh, there will be, of course, this economic impact um, in which Asian and European markets gradually recover after uh, the second quarter and the third quarter, after the summer mainly. But uh, the global economic situation will remain impaired through most of, of that second half of the year. The large, uh, the large scales, uh, quarantines, travel restrictions, and social distancing measures continue to drive a steep drop off in uh, consumer spending and subsequently business investment decreases in 2020. There is an increase in, in the number of uh, layoffs uh, and unemployment. Uh, corporate bankruptcies, however, uh, do spike, but uh, are not as bad as they were in the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And a self-reinforcing recession, the dynamics of a self-reinforcing recession extend GDP declines through the third quarter and recovery only begins and gradually at the end of the year and uh, perhaps at the beginning of next year. Next, please. That's a short recovery scenario. Um, before we go to the prolonged recovery scenario, which is not as auspicious perhaps as this one, it's important to, to see in this slide, is one image that speaks a lot. What happens in the stock markets um, uh, in India, the US, Brazil, Germany, China, Japan, the UK, France, Russia, all, all the big um, uh, stock markets in March and April have uh, decreased approximately one third 
of their value uh, because uh, of the fears of recession. Keep going, please. Um, and that recession um, is imminent, even though um, scientifically we, you cannot officially say that you're in recession after a certain period of time of decreasing um, uh, in, in a national economy, still, uh, it is pretty clear that we are leading to that. Now, the other scenario of a prolonged recovery uh, postulates that the virus spreads globally without a seasonal decline, as we were saying before, creating a demand shock that lasts until the second quarter of 2021, that is June, uh, May or June uh, of next year. This is one year from today, and a year is a long time. Health systems are, are overwhelmed in many countries, especially the poorest, with large scale human and economic impact. Um, the epidemiological scenario that uh, you see to the right, um, also not getting into the details, but basically says that um, uh, the virus does not prove to be seasonal with a mutated virus resurging, and that's another problem, that either the same virus can come on a second wave in countries in Asia mainly, like China, South Korea, that uh, are of Singapore, that have already passed uh, the worst uh, part of the pandemic, or that there is a mutated virus that can resurge in, in the fall of 2020. That would be indeed very sad, and it will lead to a spike in cases across geographies throughout the third quarter of this year. A very negative scenario, negative outlook, but unfortunately, as a science is not there to uh, tell us exactly uh, how to forecast, it can indeed happen. Next scenario, please. In the prolonged recovery um, uh, view that we have, uh, the great lockdown um, has had very many negative implications for businesses during the, uh, uh, this period. Um, it is essential to ensure that people and uh, businesses maintain their income. And that is what is being debated in the last weeks by every single government because the lockdown indeed, especially in the developing world, I come from Latin America and I, I see that very closely. There are a big percentage of our populations in my region, at least the same happened in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in parts of Asia and so on. Uh, a big percentage of the population either have to go out uh, and sell their, or do their trade to be able to eat tomorrow. If they don't go out to work because they are in lockdown, then um, uh, hunger comes. And I cannot find a better word, but it is indeed hunger. In this scenario, China and East Asia experienced double deep slowdowns as the economic recovery derailed again in 2020 and pushed into the first quarter of next year. The US and Europe experienced demand side reductions in consumer and business spending and deep recessions, as we say, throughout this year. Fiscal, monetary, and financial policies are being taken by many policymakers like credit guarantees, liquidity facilities, what we call monetary easing, and loan forbearance expanded unemployment insurance, enhanced um, social benefits, tax reliefs, and so on. Um, however, this has uh, a limit. And even though, indeed, it has uh, helped uh, some business to maintain employment and not fire the employees, um, the, the states, the governments can go just as far as a few more months. Now, the support, of course, from our vantage point should continue throughout the containment phase to minimize uh, persistent uh, negative effects that could emerge uh, from subdued investment and job losses in this severe uh, downturn. And here, I'm sure you have heard many times, but just allow me to put it in this, uh, trying to paint the situation as we see it now. Um, uh, there are people, especially in, in poor countries and in poor areas or countries, um, having to make a very difficult decision between going out to die because you will get infected with the coronavirus or going down and staying home, excuse me, and not going out, so dying of hunger because you cannot have income. So it's a very difficult thing indeed, uh, but the economic impact is estimated to be between 3.5 and 4% of the global GDP, which economists foresee to grow at minus five at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the year, actually. Next, please. So two scenarios, um, uh, short recovery, prolonged recovery. In the middle, um, the International Monetary for, uh, Fund, uh, its lead uh, economist, uh, Ms. Gita Gopinath of India, has said that the great lockdown 
will result in the worst recession since the Great Depression. And you have to remember that the Great Depression was in the 1930s. So we are talking about uh, almost 90 years, almost a century that we didn't see something like this. You see uh, those two uh, bars going down from zero. The one to the right is quite interesting because um, even in the middle of all what we remember of the uh, global financial crisis in the year 2009, the global GDP, the global um, gross domestic product decreased only 0.1%, not 1%, 0.1%. As opposed to, uh, to the left, the red uh, bar, negative bar, uh, uh, the forecast from the INF is 3.544%. It's not decimal points, it's actually full points uh, of, of uh, economy decrease this year. Next, please. So um, the recovery, uh, indeed, uh, uh, in the short recovery, there is no scenario like this for the prolonged recovery uh, from the pandemic. But the economic resuscitation will actually go into 2021 and beyond. Because if there is indeed this decrease of 3.5 to 4% of the global GDP, next year, there will be a rebound of 5.8%, but it will not be enough to go back to where we were last November, uh, last uh, January, excuse me, of 2020. Next, please. $9 trillion are expected to be lost. And public policy, uh, indeed, uh, demand that there is interagency coordination at the national level and also harmonization at the regional and global levels. That's why the multilateral institutions um, are having a lot of pressure to uh, perhaps um, uh, provide um, a path uh, or suggestions or, 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 or recommendations of policy and so on um, that countries can take because so far, um, the only common policy has been, the, uh, he, uh, of course, uh, emanating from the WHO, but also from other institutions or national governments, um, uh, focus on, focusing on health, uh, public health issues. There is no agreement on the social um, uh, reaction to the lockdown and uh, uh, very different cases depending on the country, and particularly no agreement globally on what to do with the economies. When is it? that is enough, what is the happy medium? To say, okay, uh, the lockdown is eased or eliminated, people can go back to normal, even though the virus is still there. And, and there is no agreement because there is no vaccine. And there is this global race for the vaccine uh, that unfortunately has not uh, produced results yet. But there you see in this slide, uh, several uh, lessons learned uh, from the public policy perspective. Uh, next, please. We need to accelerate a little, if I may. Um, so response measures beyond the coronavirus, uh, trying to find a path to the next normal, as I say, uh, revolve around these ideas. And it's very general, but just so you understand that there is a process behind, there is a resolve indeed everywhere to address the immediate challenges of COVID. Uh, there is resilience, uh, the ability to try and maintain some resemblance of normalcy, uh, health systems operating, economy somehow um, uh, surviving. And we do expect number three in the center, a return uh, uh, to um, economic uh, scenarios that are closer to normal, to create detailed plans uh, so business can go back um, uh, to a situation in which the effects are clearer and can uh, be combated. To the right, this uh, reimagination, we are in a scenario, this is very important to say, um, that is not, it has no precedent. It has no jurisprudence from before. Uh, we cannot, some people have compared with the Spanish flu of 1919, but it's different. It's different epidemiologically, it's different uh, macroeconomically, it's different socially in terms of communication, and we will get into that very soon. Um, there was no issues of cybersecurity there. There were no issues of ITC, ICTs, information and communication technologies, and so on. So we need to reimagine um, the next normal. What are these continuous shifts uh, looks like and the implications for our institutions and individuals should um, reinvent themselves and survive in a post-COVID world. And then finally reform, this is a, an opportunity to um, uh, understand how the industry and beyond um, operate in the future. Next, please. Um, uh, so basically, um, after understanding these two scenarios, the economic impact and some resilient measures, I'm not going to read this thing, but um, uh, indeed, it, it states uh, um, have uh, to ensure uh, access 
uh, to public services and uh, uh, to social uh, uh, social welfare uh, system. We have uh, uh, simply to say that the UN, our Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres and his team has estimated that at least, and this is not a maximum, this is a minimum, at least 2.5 trillion are needed to address the economic recession caused by COVID-19. Next, please. So here uh, you can see uh, in, in uh, getting uh, close to the conclusion, I, I won't get into the social measures because uh, this will be debated uh, later how this affects us at home. And so I'll go to the next one. I, I need to wrap up. I'm running out of time. So uh, in the next slide, uh, you will see that uh, on cybersecurity, I'm no expert whatsoever. I'm uh, just very aware of it. It was a work at the United Nations, of course. But you will hear from many experts, and uh, particularly from the case of UNITAR, I want to recognize Dr. Pavan Dugal, who is um, uh, a close friend of the United Nations and of ourselves. He will represent the UNITAR in giving you a uh, some um, uh, views and opinions on how uh, cybersecurity indeed remains very, very critical for society. But I, before we give him the floor, I simply wanted to tell you that at a glance, organizations globally are being forced to adapt, and that's the word. How do we adapt uh, to these rapidly evolving security requirements, which imply updates on critical technologies, top threat intelligent information, and best practices that sometimes are difficult to get, um, for the remote workforce. Why? Because most organizations, international or local, domestic or global, are actually working from home. Employees are working from home. And when you work from home, you can read that to the left. I don't have to ex explain to you this is a, a community of practice of experts um, that know a lot more than myself. But just as a user, uh, I can tell you that we are more vulnerable for obvious reasons. And very sad, as I said at the beginning, Cyber crime criminals around the world are capitalizing on the crisis. That's what I say when I open. It's very sad that sometimes human nature that can also show the best uh, uh, in these uh, type of historic uh, uh, situations, like the, what happened with the health workers, for instance, every night in Switzerland at 9 p.m. every night, not once a week, we clap on, on, to honor them, to recognize what it is to wake up in the morning and to say, yes, I will go back again to my hospital to to be at risk because I need to help society. But then to conclude to the right, you see four governing principles to help meet the challenges perhaps, to focus on critical operating needs. Number two, to test plans for managing security and technology risk. We will be discussing that later. Monitoring new cyber threats permanently and balancing protection with business continuity. Go to the next please. Uh, um, I think that's the last, um, uh, Marta. Thank you and Julia, thank you for helping us. I'm not going to, to read it. But indeed, uh, the shifting to work from home arrangements can open uh, multiple vectors of cyber attacks, as I mentioned, and the use of personal de devices exposes even more. And then there is a lack of social control. Um, so um, allow me to, I think uh, we have concluded, Marta, um, um, allow me to wrap up there, just uh, uh, thanking you for listening to uh, uh, what we wanted to attempt with this uh, slide. Go to the next, Marta. Um, to give you an overview of what this very sad uh, crisis has been um, uh, throughout this time. And with that, let me stop and then um, let me uh, now as uh, the moderator perhaps invite Ms. Alison August Treppel, the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, uh, CICTE, out of Washington DC to take the floor, but not before expressing on behalf of the United Nations and of UNITAR, our uh, deepest gratitude for taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise today. So, uh, Ms. Alison Ogostrepel is next. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in today. Uh, on behalf of the OAS and the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, CICTE, really it's, it's quite a pleasure and, and an honor to be calling in uh, on this roundtable discussion with you all today. Um, thank you, Alex Mejia, for your, your opening comments. Um, uh, I think we all, re we all read the news, but uh, those, those figures and statistics are certainly sobering. Um, and indeed, we are all uh, in difficult times, but it makes us even more grateful for these opportunities uh, to continue working, seeing our colleagues, uh, even if it is in a virtual format right now. Um, let me begin by thanking 
um, our, our co-organizers, if you will, the Global, the Global Fiber Alliance and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research for inviting us to participate here today. Uh, you'll be hearing shortly from my colleague, Belisario Contreras, who will offer a more detailed perspective on what we're seeing in the region. But let me begin by just offering some very um, brief general remarks. I think all of us here uh, on this uh, virtual call today understand perhaps more than anyone that ICTs, the information communication technologies, are an essential part of our lives. Uh, and even now during COVID-19, this is especially true. We are depending on technology to help us carry out our daily activities, to buy groceries, to pay bills, um, and as Alex pointed out, to work remotely and to study at a distance. Uh, particularly for, for those of us who may have children who are learning or trying to learn online. Um, and of course, with the, with the growth of uh, telemedicine, technology is allowing us to receive medical care, physical and psychological, without having to go to a hospital or clinic. So in short, technology is helping to keep each of us safe during this critical period in which we need desperately to maintain our social distancing. But to remain truly safe, <clears throat> excuse me, we also need to stay secure in the cyberspace arena. Uh, we know cybersecurity is essential across all industries and activities conducted online. And to retain the ability to use that technology confidently, states need to continuously improve their cybersecurity capacity. And a very good way to do that is through participating in events such as this one. So our goal here today is to share best practices, identify emerging threats, and help design ways to educate our communities on the importance of cybersecurity. We also hope to encourage a discussion on how technology can help us rebuild and improve our societies after this pandemic is behind us, hopefully sooner rather than later. SeekPay's cybersecurity program has worked for more than a decade now to strengthen the cyber capacities of our 34 OAS member states. Through training, simulation exercises, and awareness raising activities, over 10,000 people from throughout the Americas have benefited from our program. Um, and in this challenging time of COVID-19, we have fortunately been able to adapt many of our programs and activities to a digital format. Recently, for example, we've offered a number of, of different webinars and courses on relevant cybersecurity topics like social media, safety, and teleworking security measures. And today, we are particularly pleased to be here again with our distinguished partners and colleagues from the Global Cyber, Cyber Alliance and the UN Institute for Training and Research along with other distinguished experts um, and we look forward to, to continuing our collaboration with all of you uh, in an effort to develop solutions um, to the global challenges faced today um, by governments, private enterprise, industry, and individuals around the world. Because we know that today, more than ever, we need to be united. Despite the many challenges we face, technology gives us the possibility of working together towards a common future. And so I invite uh, all participants here today to join us in helping to define the cybersecurity problems we face and to help propose ways to address these new challenges. So with that, let me just conclude again uh, by thanking our, our distinguished speakers and panelists, and particularly you, uh, the participants, for taking the time to engage in this important conversation. My hope, uh, and again, the, the hope of the OAS and our cybersecurity program is that we will all walk away today uh, better informed and perhaps just a little bit more inspired to implement meaningful change to promote cybersecurity uh, in our region and in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, very much indeed. And um, your call to uh, unite, uh, unity um, it's quite um, uh, relevant. Um, it goes beyond the, the topic and the discipline that we will explore today. 
and uh, we will remain grateful with the Organization of American States that, are, by the way, I had the pleasure of working for in Washington a few years back. But anyway, now I, I will have a, a distinct um, uh, pleasure uh, as, as of now, because none of what you are um, watching, the uh, esteemed participants, will have happened without the support of an excellent, most excellent partner of the United Nations of UNITAR, the Global Soviet Alliance, and particularly of its um, president and CEO. Mr. Philip Reitinger is uh, the leader of this quite unique organization that um, has already supported us in the past. Uh, we have worked together in Spain, and we have a training center in the city of Malaga that, by the way, um, has benefited very much, uh, Philip, if I may uh, say that, uh, from your expertise and your uh, very generous uh, uh, support so more people can actually understand um, uh, what is uh, really global cyber resilience or cyber security as a whole. So with that introduction, uh, Philip, uh, it's my great pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, thank you also, Allison. I'm gonna speak very briefly now because I have a chance to talk at the end about some solutions in the space. I really wanted to call out only one thing. Um, and that is something you mentioned, Alex, in your slides, that we really need a focus on cybersecurity. We need to drive cybersecurity to move forward on the UN sustainable development agenda. Um, one of the things is, as Allison made clear, is that the pandemic, the COVID-19 crisis we've got right now is putting an emphasis like never before on cybersecurity because the vast majority of, of people in a lot of states and people all around the world are now working from home. We're working remotely. Today, you're gonna to hear about um, both what the threats are, um, what we're seeing in terms of the risks and the vulnerabilities that we see. And we'll close with some things that you can do right now. But the crisis, we, we cannot lose this. And I think both of your comments go to this. We cannot lose the fact that we must not be concerned only with the most critical functions. It's easy to, for example, think about power delivery and food delivery, and absolutely, those are the most important things. But everybody is working from home, from the largest critical infrastructure to the smallest businesses. And global economic recovery requires uh, that we actually treat cybersecurity and privacy as a human right, a human right that is essential to moving forward on the UN Sustainable Development Agenda. And not just essential for people in industrialized countries or for the 1% um, or for critical infrastructure, it's absolutely essential for everybody that we have a global ecosystem that protects people and allows them to have the measures that they need in place to have a resilient economy. Um, so I think you'll be learning a lot about that today. Um, and with that, um, I'll, I'll just briefly mention, thank you again for the partnership. Um, we're a global organization of 270 partners around the world. And what I've kind of just talked about is our focus. How do we actually get this done? How do we take concrete measures to give everyone around the world access to cybersecurity as an inherent part of having connectivity? So thank you, Alex, back to you. Absolutely, thank you, Phil. Indeed, um, uh, on point and on target as always, uh, but this is about partnerships. And uh, I, I just wanted to echo that you mentioned that impressive number, by the way, for the Global Cyber Alliance. Very good. So with this um, introductory presentation um, and these uh, welcome remarks from the two um, uh, leaders of the two organizations uh, also co-hosting this webinar, now we will get into the proceedings. Um, uh, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Pavan Dugal, as I mentioned before, who is um, uh, quite a unique uh, thought leader in India and beyond. He's an advocate of the Supreme Court of India and the founder and chancellor of the Cyber Law University in that country. He will give us uh, some views and perspectives on working from home and the vulnerabilities that we all have from the Asia Pacific side, and then we will come back to the Americas. Pavan, my great pleasure to give you the floor. Words. Uh, well, good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in that part of the world. But the fact remains is we are all united today because of our common connection to the internet. I thought I will want to take you through what is emerging on the horizon 
and what specifically we need to keep in mind as we go forward. First and foremost, we have to quickly look at the landscape. The landscape is not really giving us a very good feel factor. Look at this uh, data breach that's uh, impacted more than 15 million uh, users in Asia Pacific. Or look at this particular story where uh, you find that particular energy giant in Europe has actually been hit by a huge uh, ransomware and they've been asked to pay $11 million. And if you look at uh, the specific uh, breach that's taken place at Clearview in AI, that shows how these records, which are increasingly being used along with law enforcement agencies, are increasingly being under attack by cyber criminals across the world. Next slide. Well, when I look at uh, the picture emerging, yes, work from home is the new ground reality. But the fact remains is that uh, this work from home is beginning to throw up far more new and distinctive uh, challenges. Companies are increasingly being asked to focus on end point security. Further, various cyber security agencies in different parts of the world are increasingly coming to one unanimous conclusion that there are going to be massive cyber security breaches, data breaches, not just uh, in the coming times, but it will have to be the new normal as we go forward. Next slide, please. Clearly, when we look at this new normal, we quickly start realizing that these are being manifested in various cybersecurity breaches. For example, Nintendo had actually found that uh, 160,000 account uh, details had been breached of its users. Further, the Marriott chain actually found that uh, the huge, humongous uh, volume of client information had been com compromised. And now, uh, when you look at India, you find one of the biggest IT companies in India, Cognizant, being hit by a massive uh, ra ransomware attack being in the nature of maze ransomware. Next slide, please. Well, these uh, are all beginning to show one picture. Everything that really began with a, a big cyber attack on the Czech Republic's uh, topmost COVID-19 testing laboratory being the Bruno University Hospital to the attack on the US Department of Health and Human Services. It's all over the place. No one is secure. Everybody is being targeted and attacked. And when I look at these attacks, they are increasingly targeting at those crucial and critical services, which are going to have a life changing impact upon how the country's response is going to be towards fighting coronavirus. Next slide, please. No wonder when I look at this and I come to this part of the world in Asia Pacific, I find that there is news of a cyber attack in Mongolia and they have come up with a digital coronavirus malware uh, by hackers who have specifically targeted the ministries in Mongolia. Well, last year we used to say that the global cost of cyber crime should exceed $6 trillion by 2021 end. We have revised our figures that $6 trillion figure in terms of the global cost in cybercrime, we will be achieving by the end of this very year. In the UK, there's a big medical firm that's been hit by a maze ransomware. In fact, it's one of those remarkable times when uh, cyber criminals are weaponizing fear and panic uh, so as to steal data. So phishing has become the de facto focal point of criminal activity in these times. Next slide. When I look at uh, the other approaches and uh, the other scenarios, one finds, yes, you're all working from home. And then suddenly you find that video conferencing applications are the toast of the day. But yes, there are a large number of cybersecurity flaws and breaches pertaining to various video conferencing apps that have been reported across the world. Leading the brigade is Zoom, where we saw so many of these Zoom bombing or Zoom jacking cases, which have emerged across the world. So this is one increasing challenge that to users working from home 
have to deal with. Next slide, please. Well, when you are looking at the global scenario, you're finding that countries are now coming up with COVID-19 tracking apps. Now, these apps are generating their own set of problems because there are cybersecurity issues there. In fact, in one particular app, the entire API was stolen and put up online. So these apps are, are actually going ahead and collecting sensitive personal data and therefore breaching the cybersecurity of the same assumes logical sense. Next slide, please. Next slide. Well, when I look at the uh, landscape of working from home, I realize that uh, there are immense number of legal policy and regulatory challenges that work from home is beginning to throw up. But the topmost issue that it is throwing up is increasing cybersecurity breaches, both at the premises point and also at the point when they are accessing uh, the set corporate networks and devices. Next slide, please. Well, work from home, jurisprudence is slowly beginning to evolve. Next slide. And uh, we are beginning to find that different emerging technologies are also beginning to have an impact upon work from home. A lot of uh, employees working from home are using Internet of Things or IoT based devices. Uh, so there is always an exposure of corporate data via these IoT devices. Further, there's now increasing use of AI based services, both by people working from home and also by companies opening up new vistas and new vectors of uh, potential attacks by cybersecurity breaches. Next slide. So good thing that these new technologies are coming in, but uh, bad thing that there are more cybersecurity parameters. So the message that's coming out loud and clear in across the world is that when we are all thrust onto the digital uh, bandwagon, cyber law and its frameworks have to be necessarily complied with by all stakeholders as we move forward. Different countries have different cyber laws, but all these provisions have to be complied with. Next slide, please. So while we find different approaches on uh, cyber law, that's beginning to find, one unique uh, element that the world's attention is getting connected to is the issue of intermediaries. The moment you are allowing working from home, you as a company become an intermediary and a network service provider. So the issue of your liability comes up should there be a cybersecurity breach at the, uh, the premises of the working from home. So different countries have different approaches on uh, intermediary liability, and that will have to be increasingly re-looked at, redefined, given the new existing digital ground realities of today. Next slide, please. Well, uh, the good news is that cyber law is at a very nascent stage of its development. But uh, the better news also is that we are bettering with each passing day. The norms pertaining to remote working are beginning to get developed in different parts of the world. Right now, they have not yet been consolidated in legislation, but they are increasingly evolving in the form of international best practices. So cyber law is developing, and as a sub-discipline of that, cyber security law has increasingly started gaining far more attention. Next slide, please. So we are beginning to find that uh, different countries have begun to start already invoking their previously passed national cyber security laws, whether it's Singapore, whether it's Vietnam, and whether it's China, who has implemented new rules pertaining to its uh, national cyber security law it's very, very clear. Countries are resorting to their national cybersecurity laws to deal with the pandemic related uh, cybersecurity breaches and connected challenges. Next slide, please. Further, I'm beginning to find another distinctive trend uh, of the fact that in different countries, different other legislations have begun to be invoked. For in example, in Australia, you have the anti encryption legislation. So in Singapore, there's a cybersecurity law. Egypt has a cybersecurity law, and uh, you have different other countries, and even places like Macau, who are increasingly relying upon their cybersecurity law to deal with the emerging cybersecurity challenges in the pandemic times. Next slide, please. Another thing that I'm beginning to see is that uh, there's lack of cybersecurity as a culture while working from home. And that's going to require far more capacity building. 
because uh, the cybersecurity levels are much, much lower when you work from home. No wonder uh, cyber criminals have focused that as a key thrust area for breaching the cybersecurity of uh, these devices, which are being used for accessing work from home. Next slide, please. We are also beginning to find different countries coming up with national uh, legislations or shall I say uh, legal frameworks in the forms of advisories on how to go ahead and strengthen cyber resilience. Well, because uh, number one, the people working from home have become massive victims of uh, cyber crimes. Phishing has evolved as a de facto uh, economic mode of activity for cyber criminals today. Further, a uh, lot of people, and I'm from India, I can tell you a lot of Indians are falling for these phishing emails, SMSs, and websites, and losing money and their data left, right, and center. Identity thefts, frauds are big time. And I think these trends are only telling us that this is a precursor of much bigger cybercrime revolution that we are going to see in the coming times. Next slide, please. So consequently, uh, when we are working from home, we will have to be careful about data protection. And there, uh, the world is a divided house. Different countries have some specific legislations on data protection, like the General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union. But a number of countries do not have direct legislations on data protection or data privacy. And that's going to be a big challenge for those countries, especially developing countries, when they increasingly deal with these cybersecurity breaches and loss of confidential corporate data while working from home. Next slide, please. Similarly, confidentiality will be a matter of immense concern. Uh, I think the focus will have to be now, while this new normal has come across, companies will have to comply with local labor laws. There'll be increasing focus on obligations on ensuring safety and health of employees. And I would say health also of the uh, systems of the employees working from home. But ultimately, it will have to boil down to adopting cybersecurity as a way of life during COVID-19 times. Next slide, please. And that's pretty much universal that I see across the world. There's also increasing focus. Countries are beginning to find trends where companies are saying, let's start involving these uh, legal strategies as part of our business models. Let's, let's have the best case scenarios, the worst case scenarios. And I think we'll have to be prepared for worst case scenario as well. Further, I've seen a massive increase of digital virtual learning programs uh, because actually going ahead and strengthening the, the skill sets of employees while they are in the lockdown periods is a good strategy that companies are increasingly uh, focusing in terms of creating more awareness about cybersecurity. Next slide, please. So various of these online platforms have become very, very popular in terms of education. But while all this is happening, another big challenge for countries of the world. Fake news seems to be peaking. Uh, there's so much of fake news that this pandemic has produced that no wonder it's been given the title of infodemic. And in the absence of uh, specific national legislations to deal with this fake news pandemic also having rep repercussions on uh, cybersecurity, we will have new challenges for countries and for companies as we go forward, because this will be have to be specifically addressed as a distinctive emerging challenge. Next slide, please. Fake news is going to have a direct impact upon uh, cybersecurity, but ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be prepared from a more holistic perspective. Based on what I'm seeing on the landscape, I'm already seeing the evolution of a new cyber world order. This will be a new cyber world order that will await us after we are victorious against uh, coronavirus. Now, I don't know when is that going to happen, a few months, maybe a two, three quarters, maybe one year. But clearly, once uh, we come to the end of the coronavirus times, the ground realities of cyberspace would have changed dramatically. Already within the pandemic times, different countries are increasingly uh, gaining upon themselves massive powers of uh, centralization, which could have an impact upon cybersecurity and also upon enjoyment of digital liberties. Next slide. I think world will also have to be increasingly prepared for more of, uh, shall I say, monitoring, more of surveillance, and more of facial recognition. More and more companies and governments are focusing on facial recognition as a means 
for enhancing their control on people. And this facial recognition will increasingly have to be done in the digital format, which again is likely to bring forward new distinctive challenges in terms of cybersecurity, breaches and connected ramifications. Next slide, please. No wonder when we talk of this uh, space, we are also seeing a massive migration during these periods to the dark net. This evening on the dark net is up for sale, a new vaccine against coronavirus. Uh, they are selling the plasma of uh, patients who have got cured from uh, coronavirus. We don't know the authenticity of these claims, but nonetheless, uh, the gullible people are falling for the same. But increasingly, I'm seeing this migration that's going to keep on happening to the dark net for both legitimate and uh, for illegal purposes. And hence, it becomes very crucial that appropriate legal nuances pertaining to dark net and also the cybersecurity ramifications will have to be addressed. Next slide. I believe there will be now more increased cybersecurity breaches coming from the dark net and we will have to be prepared. That's why the focus on capacity building becomes for so very essential. We have started these two new courses under the Cyber Law University umbrella, where we have specifically uh, sensitizing people about coronavirus, work from home and legal issues, and also the entire big issues of cyber law, cyber crime, and cyber security during coronavirus times. And we are seeing a massive surge in interest levels as far as these emerging topics are concerned. Next slide, please. Well, all I can currently say is, as I come towards the closure of my presentation, that as we go forward, cyber security breaches will be the new normal. It will not be surprising for us that we get breached. The bigger focus will have to be on cyber resilience. But inculcating cyber resilience as a popular culture may start taking some time. Hence, cyber legal frameworks will have to play a very, very important and significant role in the dissemination of appropriate capacity buildings and also creating deterrent legal frameworks. Clearly, when we are working from home, the jurisprudence is evolving. By uh, the time we are uh, supposing we come to the end of 2020, and if we were to write a book on uh, the jurisprudence on work from home, which could be of 100 pages, then today in May 2020, we are only writing the sixth or the seventh page. That will just give you an inclination of how things have to rapidly develop in terms of evolving jurisprudence concerning remote working, in, for, in terms of uh, massive developments concerning cybersecurity jurisprudence, I expect large number of uh, countries to start coming up with the distinctive small but effective legislations to deal with coronavirus uh, cyber related issues, including cybersecurity breaches, because the new manifestations of these cybersecurity breaches on the COVID-19 times are presenting immense challenge to existing legal frameworks. If we are often finding that existing legal frameworks will uh, not necessarily be adequate and therefore uh, we will have to increasingly not just amend, update and review existing uh, cyber law and cyber security legal frameworks, but we will also have to start inculcating a culture of digital compliance, compliance uh, towards digital uh, safety, towards uh, digital resilience, towards digital maturity and towards cyber hygiene. And I think that will be the new normal as we go forward. We don't have to be uh, really panicky for, against uh, the cyber security breaches we will have to start coming up with new innovative approaches on how to deal with this new normal that will be affecting all of us across the world, a common uh, leveler for the world. And clearly governments and various stakeholders will have to quickly start coming up with new effective mechanisms and uh, response processes so as to deal with the emerging challenges that cybersecurity and its breaches are beginning to throw for the world and for the global citizens at large. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Over back to you, uh, Alex. Thank you. Absolutely. Th thank you so much, uh, Pavan. Um, I, I, by the way, I forgot to say at the beginning of your presentation that I had seen uh, quite a pro prolific author you are, and that we wanted to show while Pavan um, uh, uh, share his knowledge, very many uh, 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 textbooks that he has published. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite impressive, but again, my appreciation to you, Pavan, for taking this time to share uh, the things that you are doing at the Cyber University and also, uh, also what is happening in Asia Pacific and, and India particularly now. 
allow me to go uh, uh, to the next speaker. Um, I also forgot to say that we have only 10 minutes um, uh, for speaker. We remain a little flexible, but please try to adapt to that uh, time frame. Um, uh, now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Belisario Contreras, manager of the cybersecurity program of the Organization of American States, uh, who now has the floor. Belisario, bienvenido. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alex. Thank you. Uh, good uh, morning or good uh, afternoon or evening, depending on of your time zone. Um, first of all, I uh, would like to, to express our, our gratitude to the distinguished representative of our member states here today and to all of you, ladies and, and gentlemen, who are taking uh, the time to, to participate in, in this webinar. Once again, thank you to Phil uh, and to all our colleagues uh, at UNITAR uh, who, who made this possible. Uh, we'd like to, to express our true appreciation uh, for your support over the past years, especially during these circumstances uh, of uncertainty. Uh, we'd like to say that so far uh, the journey would not be possible without you, uh, without the support of member states, observer states, but also the partners from civil society, the private sector, and other international organizations. Also, thank you to, to Alison, who is here, and to our Secretary General, who have provided a lot of support and trust during this time of uncertainty. Um, we like to, to share with you, well, something very briefly, as, as Pavan and as Alex, you, you clearly mentioned, uh, the social distances practices and the adoption of telework uh, had caused like a different in, in kind of impact. Uh, we have seen that the data traffic has increased up to 50% in, in certain countries. Uh, Pavan tackled the issue of the healthcare institutions and also I uh, would like to, to point out that uh, Interpol issued a purple, uh, purple warning throughout the world uh, measuring that uh, these institutions that are at the forefront have been targets of ransomware attacks. Also, uh, we have seen that uh, private sector data uh, has reported a, a, an increase up to 350% on, on malicious uh, websites since the pandemic started. Next slide, please. Um, over the past eight years, our, our program has been active in, in three main areas. Uh, one is policy, policy, technical capacity, as well knowledge and awareness. Uh, as soon as the, the COVID-19 pandemic started, we started with immediate actions. The first one uh, is uh, the development of uh, digital cyber diplomacy courses. Uh, for example, uh, this week, uh, we just started with Diplo Foundation uh, training to a targeted to, to policy, especially MFA officials uh, on digital and cyber diplomacy issues. At the same time, uh, so I want to mention that these courses are also with the support of the general support of the government of, of Canada. At the same time, um, on international law, with the support of the Netherlands, we readapted some courses, some activities that we have on, on this issue, and we be sure are gonna be and continue very important for the upcoming years. Um, so we, we readapted that we're gonna about to start in just a couple of weeks uh, courses on, on, on these issues. Of course, it has not been uh, quite easy. And last but not least, um, we are um, uh, speeding up a process that actually we initiated uh, with civil society organizations through the region. And we're gonna uh, probably have ready by the end of this year, early next year, uh, best practices toolkit for national cybersecurity strategies. Next slide. On the technical capacities and uh, information sharing, our CISAD network has proven to be agile and very important mechanism since its inception. We have already organized two virtual meetings and we're looking forward to a third meeting. The first one was uh, very key with the support of the DHS CISA, the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency of the United States. Uh, we're particularly focused on critical infrastructure and the COVID responses. And the second one took just place a couple of weeks ago, and it was uh, focused with uh, sharing experiences of, of best practices with, with the private sector. The third one most likely uh, will focus on, 
on key essential services. Next slide. We also, um, on, on our knowledge and awareness, raising components since the first time, uh, probably you have seen us a little bit more active here. Uh, since we started that many countries were starting to, to telework, uh, to use uh, social media, we started releasing heavy campaigns on, on, on this, and these are some issues. Next slide. Um, you, of course, uh, also in seeing the, the video calls uh, was a, 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 or had been an important issue, and we released uh, basic 10 tips on how to do the secure use of, of video and conference call software uh, during, during these times uh, of social distancing. Next slide. We also, um, since I started, uh, many countries started to, to telework uh, in, in America's region, we started organizing webinars like this one. The first one was with Remicro. Uh, the second one was with a recognized hacker uh, from Spain. Um, but just trying to deliver content that could be very useful. Next slide. Uh, we also partner with uh, uh, with our, our, our actors from the social media like Facebook and uh, Amazon Web Services on, on social network issues. And based on existing memorandums of cooperation that we have with with private sector actors, we have also uh, distributed officially uh, some of the COVID-19 responses that uh, several companies around the world are, are offering, like Cisco, Micro, and others. So based on that, on those agreements that we have with them, we have used them uh, as a vehicle for, for member states. Next slide. Um, we also agree with, uh, also what just Phil mentioned in, in his introductory remarks, uh, cybersecurity, privacy, and digital rights should be all together. Uh, that's why um, we invited uh, Citizen Lab. It's a really famous NGO uh, in Canada. Uh, historically, they have produced really, really good investigative reports. Actually, they were very active or they have been very active on the video calls issue. And we uh, were honored to have our freedom of speech repertoire with us. Um, these are some basically a graphic a recording of, of the webinar in the, the four OS official languages. And uh, we are also want to, to point out that, that, that these uh, digital rights, privacy is an important issue, as well the gender inclusion. It should never be forgotten. And also it's, uh, I'm glad that they put that. Um, tomorrow, we are gonna have also a, another webinar with millennials and centennials. Uh, I was very interesting to see that the U.S. Um, a commission, Solarium Cyberspace Solarium Commission, also mentioned the importance of youth and how the youth uh, will need to get engaged on cyber issues. And they mentioned, for example, to look at CISA uh, as the same interest of joining Google, Facebook, of, or these big uh, multinationals. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are kind of, of a common initiatives and we will keep you posted, we will invite you to, to, to participate. But we want to make sure that our member states and the citizens of, of the Americas, uh, they know uh, they can come with the, with the organization for, for whatever they, uh, they need. Next slide. And uh, something that we have the honor to, to present uh, to our Commission on Hemispheric Security and uh, to you today, uh, we want to put uh, present three actions for your consideration. Just that's it, three actions. Uh, the number one is to use, um, adjust national frameworks. Number two, it's uh, increase international cooperation. And number three is unify awareness raising. Uh, we believe that countries need the agility of dating uh, or developing national cybersecurity strategies uh, as well their legal and regulatory framework regarding cyberspace. You mentioned the energy sector as well. So probably we may need to, to get revised certain countries that don't have a certain uh, frameworks on how to protect the energy sector. Again, uh, just last Friday in the United States, uh, the White House just issued an executive order of the importance of, of the energy. And although it's not a directly cybersecurity issue, it could impact uh, the technology and it could uh, be potential cybersecurity issue, and uh, it could be a, a tremendous impact for the for the whole world. 
we believe that these initiatives must uh, need to have a multi-stakeholder approach, including urgent attention to, to the construction of incident response capacities in all sectors, financial, communications, energy, you name it, health, of course. Um, governments cannot act alone, and the participation of the technical community and the private sector uh, it would be essential to build these uh, response and resilience capacities. Uh, as well, if we believe on this adjustment of, of national frameworks, uh, countries uh, should look at the Budapest Convention as the most global and inclusive convention to fight against cybercrime. Today, 55 countries have already ratified and 10 other are requesting addition. Therefore, uh, countries should consider acceding to this instrument as a tool of immediate international cooperation. Uh, digital rights, including privacy and freedom of speech, should never be forgotten as we update this uh, and adjust this, these national frameworks. Uh, on the increased international cooperation, as the information sharing has increased since COVID-19 erupted, uh, we need to maintain this momentum, catalyze it and formalize it in all related cyber-related issues. There will be a, cybersecurity will require international cooperation. There needs to be a need to increase trust at all levels between countries and industries. Um, tomorrow there will be a, a new virus or what we could call a common enemy in cyberspace. And our collaboration at the policy, technical and law enforcement levels will be vital tools to protect us and to allow us to work together to find a, a solution. Uh, then the third uh, proposal is uh, unify awareness raising, uh, awareness uh, raising efforts. Uh, education, we believe we need to start teaching young people about cybersecurity, but also increase these efforts at all ages, at all levels. No matter the industry, uh, no one is going to be immune to a cyber incident or to a bad click. Not even people or, or experts like you uh, working on this, you somehow are, are exposed to, to this. Um, governments and the private sector should join efforts and work toward unified awareness uh, campaign. Um, we need to consider that the users should never be the last line of defense on, on these issues. And uh, everyone needs to play a role, educating each other and making these awareness campaigns uh, more viral. Um, we believe that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility and that we need to, to push forward to a, a gender and inclusive approach to, to cyber issues. Next slide. Um, we understand that there could be several challenges, um, but um, we also believe that there are going to be opportunities to call to, to see at this as a empowering opportunities. Um, and here uh, we, we invite all the leadership to, to have a, a creativity, critical thinking and complex problem solving skills and to create this if they are not uh, uh, on the community um, because um, the COVID-19 pandemic have accelerated again the digital transformation and it will be essential to, to have these skills in order to to promote uh, a more reliable and trustworthy internet. Um, again, we want to, to express our gratitude uh, to, to all of you, and this is what we want to share today. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Belisario. Indeed, um, a very impressive overview. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, from the perspective of the Americas, that complements uh, rather well the perspective from Asia Pacific that uh, Pavan gave us before. Um, uh, our appreciation to the Organization of America and States and particularly to, to what you do. Now, to continue with um, the agenda, and I will have to become the back cop now uh, because we are really uh, lagging behind in, in time management and, and we uh, should have just 10 minutes uh, with perhaps with a little buffer, as I say. Um, uh, but with that uh, having said, I don't want to diminish uh, the next speaker because he's indeed impressive and we are very happy to have him. Let me introduce now Mr. Ken Kern, the Chief Information Officer and Special Assistant for International Relations at the Attorney's uh, Office, District Attorney's Office of the New York County. So dear Ken, uh, welcome to this webinar. The floor is yours. 
Can you hear us? Ken? So, uh, thank you so much. I want to start by thanking the United Nations and the Global Cyber Alliance for the opportunity to convene uh, and discuss such an important subject of cybersecurity. Uh, I particularly just want to uh, mention our um, great reliance on the Global Cyber Alliance, uh, Phil Redinger and his team over the years to help us protect ourselves as an organization and to help the law enforcement community. So my, um, my conversation will, with you today will really be about uh, what has law, what's law enforcement look like in our, in our new reality. Uh, it, as an organization, we are the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. We're at the epicenter of um, you know, the the uh, United States uh, criminal activity and uh, New York handling anywhere between 60,000 and 100,000 cases a year on a wide variety. We're both a local office uh, taking care of the, uh, our citizens and our businesses locally, but also we have a national and international footprint. So my comments today will speak both to what we see as an office, but what our partners throughout the world in law enforcement are dealing with. So on behalf of District Attorney Vance, who's uh, you see on the slide, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I'll start by, uh, next slide please. I'll start by noting that in many ways, uh, law enforcement had to radically rethink the way that we oper operate to understand uh, the way that law enforcement uh, thinks, you have to understand that the protection of our witnesses, the protection of our confidential informants, the data and information we have uh, is of the utmost uh, security, not just in terms of security of the data itself, but the physical safety of those involved with matters. So the approach has always been, we need to keep that content both safe but also within the building uh, we our our thought was you we need to have our folks all here in in the building COVID-19 has changed the entire reality of that um, and in order to effectuate what you see on the screen crimes associated with all of these matters whether they're sex crimes or cyber crimes homicides how do we change that paradigm? Next slide, please. The very first thing we had to do was take our staff, knowing that crime was not going to uh, abate in any way, and uh, place them in a posture where they had not been before, which was put them into a virtual work environment and guide them on a dime very quickly over, over a weekend um, and change the way that they understood how they were going to work. Um, next slide, please. Our, uh, all our, our personnel within New York, and we have personnel uh, located around the world, but all in, all our personnel accounts to about 2,300 individuals who are working on those 100,000 cases and investigations. Um, on March 1, when we took a look at how many people had been working remotely, it was 27 individuals. Uh, by March, uh, by this week, we are now having active sessions, individuals who are on working remotely, well over a thousand. Um, next slide, please. And concurrently, we have anywhere between 700 and 900 people who are, um, who are working uh, remotely. Why do I share that? I share it because our infrastructure had to uh, radically change to support this. If people are going to be addressing the crimes of cybercrime and our investigators are able to do their work and our, and our lawyers are able to do their work, what tools are they able to use? How do we put them in a position to succeed to do their work? The work has never stopped for us. Uh, it has just moved uh, and within a 72 hour period, we had to create the infrastructure so that everybody is at home and working. There was a reference earlier to uh, personal devices. Uh, 
Um, again, our, our general paradigm of thinking was we wanted folks here. Now we had to go ahead and provide uh, Danny issued, our office issued laptops out so that people were not putting themselves and their investigations and our witnesses at risk by using their personal devices to, to investigate cases and to communicate with witnesses. Next slide, please. This is, so this is, this is a, not a, a new normal, not only for us within New York, but all over the world. Uh, my partners with the City of London Police, the Paris Prosecutor's Office, uh, and those throughout Asia as well, uh, have all had to uh, convert their uh, inward looking, inward sitting uh, infrastructure and flip that within a short period of time and do it safely within the cybersecurity paradigms. Remember, for, uh, for law enforcement, uh, we not only have to have our staff in work operating in a safe cyber secure posture, but our mission is to inform um, and protect those that we have uh, governance over. So part of what we do is to constantly be using our social media techniques and others to explain how individuals can protect themselves. At the same time, we have to explain to our staff how to operate in this way. So the scams that we see in law enforcement that we are dealing with right now in this very building that I'm sitting in right now in Manhattan, in lower Manhattan, where police officers are continuing to bring cases in and we're de developing the new reality of how that works, um, are scams related to uh, COVID-19, health insurance frauds, uh, scammers who are seeking information, uh, personal identification information, individuals who are sending links. Let me give you some examples. Next slide, please. In calls, uh, we've seen an increase of both emails and calls from uh, our, uh, our IRS, our Internal Revenue Service, where we uh, citizens had been awaiting checks in order to help them through this crisis. Um, and we were seeing many, many victims falling prey to that because, as we all know, this crisis is not only changing us as we work, but our minds are being constantly challenged by fear, confusion, and criminals uh, simply exploit that, uh, that opportunity. So we see testing scams. Um, we see uh, uh, frequently uh, scams related to donations, whether they're from national health organizations, the CDC, the, which is the US-based uh, center for uh, dealing with the COVID crisis. And most importantly, for purposes of this conversation, we see a radical upswing in, in communications and emails containing phishing links, uh, directing uh, people to COVID-19 news and websites Next slide, please. And we've had to provide cautionary guidance to our, but not only our staff, but our citizenry uh, and our small business and, and uh, business community on how not to fall prey to that. Next slide. So two examples of matters that our office has been dealing with. On the left-hand side, you see a phishing uh, uh, email, a scam related from purporting to be from the CDC, asking for individuals to click on that link. Um, to the right, you see a specialist, a, Sing a Singaporean specialist email, which individuals would immediately think, well, that's something that might be important for me to click on. I want the most accurate information for my family, for my, for my children. What do I need to do uh, to protect ourselves? These scams, which we would normally handle and address and investigate locally here in this very building that I sit in, we've now had to convert and say, in uh, our cyber investigators, our, our lab technicians, all of those folks who are on the very front line of dealing with these sort of 
scams and frauds are now having to do that not only at home in New York, but where they've been sent uh, to return home domestically and sometimes internationally. Next slide, please. And I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to wrap up in uh, two minutes. The continuation of these scams are related to COVID masks. Um, COVID-19 uh, finders where people are asked to click on or, or import, and then very basic things. We all know that uh, with so much time at home, uh, Netflix and other video streaming uh, platforms have become very important to managing a household, to trying to get used to staying at home. So we're partnering with Netflix and many of the other Silicon Valley com uh, tech communities to figure out ways in which not only can we communicate about the frauds effectively, but how we can investigate rapidly and try to uh, uh, do our three missions, which is one, investigate, two, exonerate, and three, prosecute when, when the, the opportunity is there to do so. Next slide, please. I want to emphasize one tool that we have used uh, quite frequently, which is the G uh, Global Cyber Alliance Small Business Tool. Uh, you, we know within New York and within communities all around the world, the backbone of our commerce is at the small and mid-sized um, business communities. Uh, and we see our fraudsters right now really focusing. And when we go into the dark web to study and our investigators are in there and analyzing what criminals are doing, um, these are rational thinkers, uh, those who we believe are committing criminal activity. They're rational actors. They will go to the, the place where they're most likely to secure the things that they want, which is a monetized asset, and then to uh, uh, have that moved away from the victim into, into their hands. This is to say that we've relied and communicated the District Attorney uh, of New York in partnership with the, uh, both the White House and, and our international partners are communicating about how we can um, really not just come out with advice that is um, too generic, but to really hone it down in the ways that my fellow speakers have talked about to target that uh, and guide people through it. And so uh, next please. I'll end with the following. Um, the, what we continue to see are um, the most challenging and the most painful cases of those in which fraud is related to the very tools in which safety is meant to, um, to protect. So things like masks that are so mission critical, both within our healthcare sector and our partners there, but throughout our society as individuals are walking around with the masks and they're walking around often with masks that uh, are not secure, not safe because they come into the marketplace. Um, I'll end on this comment. Um, we rely on our partners around locally and around the world. And something that we are doing is really um, uh, partnering with entities such as the New York City um, Cyber Command and the New York City uh, uh, sectors to make sure that we're sharing information in rapid time. Um, and so we thank the United Nations and Global Cyber Alliance for its leadership. We look to continue our partnership with both entities um, and anybody who has been listening to this uh, for any guidance on law enforcement tools and techniques please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to partnering with you in the future. Indeed, indeed. Kent, uh, thanks to you. Uh, thanks for sharing these things uh, from the law enforcement perspective. Uh, continue doing the excellent job uh, that you do at the district attorney's office in New York, and uh, my respect um, uh, for sharing your knowledge. Very good. Um, we are lagging behind in time, so um, it's always a difficult uh, work of a moderator but I'll try um, to remind you when the 10 minutes uh, are over, I'll basically tell you you have one more minute. So please indulge me. And uh, with that, um, we will continue now from the global perspective. Uh, we went to the Asia Pacific perspective, then we went to the Americas perspective, and now particularly 
uh, the law enforcement perspective. But it is very important to add to all this amalgamation the industry perspective. And for that, it is my great pleasure uh, to invite Mr. Kane Hermsen um, right here. Uh, information Chief Information uh, Officer, excuse me, the Global Coordinator for the Charter of Trust for Siemens. Uh, Mr. Hermsen uh, will be speaking on building resilience from collaboration, the industry perspective. Okay, I welcome you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, and thanks uh, for inviting me to this talk. It's a great honor to be along among these distinguished speakers, we've seen a lot of perspectives already and they all add to the picture. And let me give another one uh, on top of this. And that is from the private companies. Um, and that's an important perspective because large parts of um, the digital infrastructure is actually operated, maintained and manufactured, of course, by private companies. Now, with that being said, mm, I would like to give um, yet another perspective on what it means if we think about uh, cybersecurity. And we've heard um, the different threats and we've heard what it means for working from home. Um, and we see that the crisis brings a lot of, of, of hardships. But I wanna ask you three questions. Um, what do you think about the possibility of not having access to health data in this crisis? What about the possibility of supply chains being interrupted? Or what about us sitting at home and facing a blackout? No electricity. Well, all of this can also be caused by a cyber attack. So let's not only think about cyber attacks in the sense of interruption of the internet as such, but it can cause interruptions of crucial services like healthcare, um, food supply or electricity. Now, my job is, my job and our team's job is to not let that happen. So I work at Siemens um, and first and foremost, of course, we need to protect our people. We have 380,000 employees worldwide. At this point in time, 140,000 are working from home the rest of which um, is still working in the factory. So we have most of our factories actually up and running um, worldwide. Um, but it is also our job to protect our customers um, and help them keep up the cybersecurity. Because we know that even one successful attack could already be catastrophic. The way we do this is um, through using the help of our experts that are sitting um, in our various offices and factories worldwide. Now, what is interesting to cybersecurity, please go to the next slide, is that while digital technologies are omnipresent, so is the need for cybersecurity. So we need to be cybersecure if we think about our information technology, we need to be cyber secure when we think about our operational technology. And here we're talking, for example, about factories and power plants. And we need to be cyber secure when we talk about the internet of things, which is growing rapidly. Now, the interesting part is also that cyber security needs to be there in all sectors, virtually all sectors. There is no industry which doesn't have to be concerned about cyber security be it the critical infrastructures, um, be it factories, be it uh, smart homes, be it healthcare. We need to have cybersecurity in all of these sectors. So you see it's really transcending, let's say the, the economy and the economic ecosystem. And that's why we believe um, it needs collaboration. We think and we really believe that cybersecurity is not possible without these different actors collaborating. Next slide, please. And that's why we came to realize that if we need to collaborate on cybersecurity, let's think about ways to do that. And that's how um, we came to form the chart of trust with a couple of other organizations. Next slide, please. Now, 
in that chart of trust, which really is a group and an initiative formed by different global companies, we always had the ambition of representing the different industries that I have just been talking about, also representing the different technologies that comprise the digital ecosystem. And we gave ourselves a program um, that we call the 10 principles, which we believe actually um, during the crisis or given the COVID-19 crisis are probably more relevant than ever. And these 10 principles also form um, the program in which we now work together on concrete solutions. So one by one, we're now tackling these uh, principles and are working on solutions that we are implementing among the partners. So in the companies that comprise this initiative, we're also implementing the solutions uh, with the ambition of leading by example. Next slide, please. To give you a little bit of an insight of what that means, I, I want to share with you what we are working on currently. And all of this ties back to the 10 principles um, I was introducing earlier. One fundamental core that I introduced was that cybersecurity rests on different shoulders along the supply chain. So we are working on concrete solutions on how to enable security along the supply chain. It is important to notice that virtually no company is uh, producing all the product solutions or services with 100% value add on their own. They always have to rely on suppliers. Now, the suppliers need to live up to a certain level of cybersecurity. Otherwise, the product that you're manufacturing or the service that you're offering cannot be cyber secure um, if not all players along the, uh, along the supply chain are doing their share. So what we've developed is um, we call the baseline cybersecurity requirements for partners in the supply chain. At Siemens, for example, we take these baseline requirements, they're now into our standard terms and conditions, and now we require suppliers, if they want to do business with us, they need to comply to these cybersecurity requirements. Now, we're not only forcing this on suppliers, um, we are at the same time also offering help to them to become better at cybersecurity. So we see that as a big global corporation, we do have a role and responsibility also to develop uh, our partners towards more cybersecurity. Now, of course, we're not the only ones, and we, we heard it earlier, we, there have been some representatives from authorities, um, like Ken, for example, but also Belisario. It is very important to work together with these authorities, um, governments worldwide, um, to shape cybersecurity. Now, what we're seeing, and I think Pavan, you said that, is that um, there is a you know, fragmentation of rules and regulations worldwide. There's different companies stepping up and thinking about cybersecurity differently from a legal perspective. Now, if you ask me as a cybersecurity expert, actually cybersecurity isn't very different no matter where you go in which region. So from a technical perspective, Globally, it's more or less the same. Right? It shouldn't be that different. So what we as a global company have as an interest, and so do a lot of other global companies, by the way, is to harmonize the regulation and the standardization to create a level playing field for cybersecurity. That's something that we're working on. Also, we think we need to change the game if, when we think about cybersecurity a little bit. So we need to go towards something called cybersecurity or security by default. It shouldn't be an afterthought, that's one, but it also shouldn't be the choice of the user to be cyber secure. It should be the choice of the user to be not cyber secure, if at all. So we need to really have cybersecurity built into product solution and services. Also, cybersecurity, we think, is a business opportunity. It is often seen as the trade-off um, to doing business is security. We do not think that's the case. We think, and that's what we're advocating for, cybersecurity is a business opportunity because it's the license to play in the field of digital offerings. We think that cybersecurity creates sustainable digital offerings. And that's what we're advocating for when, for example, we also engage in education 
and I fully agree uh, with Belisario, for example, we need to do this at all ages. It starts in kindergarten, if not earlier, and it ends after post-retirement. There's literally, in this day and age, there's nobody who shouldn't be um, at least a little bit cyber literate, and there's a lot of experts that need to know even more, uh, at the very least, if you're running a business. And that's why, next, please. Uh, and you have one more minute, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, next, um, that's my uh, uh, almost final slide. So <laughs> if we think about small and medium enterprises, they also need to be aware that cybersecurity is important and it can be a business opportunity. So that's something we're advocating for. And now next and final slide. In summary, what we call for is to take it serious. Cybersecurity is a serious matter. You need to manage the risk there are risks, yes, don't ignore them, manage them. We need to all collaborate on this. It cannot be done alone. And yes, it does need an invest. It does cost money, that's true, but we believe it will pay off. And last but not least, we need to educate much better on cybersecurity because we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai, uh, and uh, I appreciate the efforts uh, on the time management side. Uh, indeed, um, we appreciate you calling our attention to the Charter of Trust. Uh, I will be reading more about it and also for sharing the uh, perspective from, from the industry side. Uh, quite, quite interesting to see resilience from the way you postulated it. Now, we will make a small uh, change, uh, and I do thank Kirsten for accepting to, to move down in, in the agenda. Uh, and instead, uh, we will be introducing now um, Amy Jordan. Amy uh, is the lead of the cybersecurity, um, uh, I have it here because it's no longer in the screen, oh, thank you. Um, uh, Amy is the lead of the cybersecurity delivery at the World Economic Forum. She will be uh, talking to us on building resilience for small businesses. So we went from industry now to the perspective from small businesses, but also about uh, the view from remote workers as well as key lessons. Amy, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate and for the views of all of the contributors so far. I will keep uh, my remarks as quick as I can. I'm aware we're um, running out of time. Um, and just to be clear, I'll be giving a, a kind of high level view so not just talking about small businesses, but giving a, an overview of what the World Economic Forum is doing in this space, um, which will include the range of topics. Um, so if we could move on to the first slide, please. And the next one, please. I just uh, wanted to start by setting out uh, what the World Economic Forum is, is doing uh, on the coronavirus um, pandemic as a whole. Um, we have launched a unique uh, COVID action platform, which um, brings together a unique grouping of industry and public sector uh, to address uh, three main priorities. So galvanizing the, go the global business community, protecting people's livelihoods and facilitating business continuity and mobilizing cooperation and business support. Um, and we're working with a very wide range of our partners from across public private sectors to do that. Next slide, please. Um, so the forum's platform helps accelerate and drive forward a number of initiatives um, to deliver collaborative solutions in these very difficult times. So some examples there of our work across various different sectors. And if you're interested in, in finding out more about all of the work we're doing, there's lots of information available, including readouts of the weekly um, action platform uh, meetings, which are held every week on our website. But moving on uh, to the next slide, please, on our cybersecurity response. So in the Centre for Cybersecurity at the World Economic Forum, we've been looking at the impact of COVID-19 from a range of perspectives bringing uh, our partners together and helping to promote solutions to continue to protect against the threats that, as many um, of the contributors have already mentioned, are not going away even in this uh, time of crisis. So we're looking at four different areas. Firstly, identifying the challenges, then uniting the community, 
uh, developing principles for leaders and then looking to prepare for the future. So just to move on to the next slide, in terms of the challenges, which have already been discussed in quite some detail uh, already from, by the previous speakers. Um, so just to skim over them, obviously working from home has opened many more vectors for attacks. Social engineering tactics are more effective on, on a workforce who, which has many other pressures, are vulnerable, are distracted by children and uh, running around them and other things. Um, critical business assets and functions are more exposed um, and infrastructure services have unfortunately been hit. Um, hospitals, etc., by new forms of ransomware trying to disrupt vital services. Um, I won't go into any more detail on the challenges because I think they've already been well covered already. Um, just to move on to the next slide. Um, so the work that, that we've been doing here at the forum with our partners include, like many others, uh, hosting a series of webinars, of which we've had two already and are planning more, um, to bring together views of, of senior leaders um, across the cybersecurity ecosystem who uh, are sharing their perspectives uh, and their views on, on how we can help uh, manage this crisis together. Um, we've also been building a global repository of uh, pro bono cybersecurity re resources for COVID-19 response organizations, looking at uh, the programs around the world who, which would be most useful to those who are in the front line of COVID-19 response and to try and aggregate those into an easy to use resource um, and share those uh, with the organizations that need them the most. Um, so we've re received responses from many partners and are developing some new offerings to help meet those needs. Um, and to link those into the wider forum COVID-19 action platform response. So if you're interested in um, learning more about that, please do uh, email Daniel, whose email is on the screen, uh, or contact me for, for more information. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Another area where we are looking to support uh, organizations uh, in public and private sectors are thinking about how we can support leaders uh, in these very difficult times. So last year, we developed a cybersecurity guide for leaders in uh, today's digital world, um, jointly with many of our partners. But we found that the pace of change in the ways of working um, as a result of the current crisis has led us to look again at new challenges um, and that are facing leaders in particular, uh, and how we can think about how we can work with our partners to help address those challenges. So we're building um, some principles for, for leadership, um, including the ones uh, on the screen there. So fostering a culture of cyber resilience, strengthening collaboration across the ecosystem, protecting critical assets, uh, and balancing risk-informed decisions to ensure operational continuity for the crisis and beyond it. Um, and working with our partners to capture strategic insights, leadership messages and practical guidance, um, which will be turning into a, a short publication designed for CISOs and risk officers across the world, which we will hopefully be publishing shortly. So um, keep your eyes out for that. Um, next slide, please. So we're also hoping to look to what the future can bring and how we can help uh, make sure our partners are prepared um, for uh, the new norm and a, a kind of different shaped future, which I think we will be left with um, after the crisis uh, is over. So many elements there, remote working brings an increased focus on secure collaboration, but on the same time as we are already seeing a change in uh, modus operandi from cybercrime groups. Um, a new focus on business continuity, planning and resilience, which might come out of this crisis, is a good thing in terms of more built-in security solutions, but might also mean that businesses face increased regulation, for example. Um, we're already seeing the economic impact of the virus, and whilst this might lead to efficiencies and increased automation, automation which will be good if it's done well, um, it's also a risk that uh, key skills uh, will be lost and security, especially cybersecurity, might be seen as a, 
additional extra which people can do without. Um, we're also thinking about the potential impact on the cybersecurity market, risk of consolidation and the impact on startups and the innovation landscape. Um, so we will be watching all of this carefully over the months ahead and invite you to contact us and get involved with our work if you're interested in any of the topics um, we've already mentioned. Um, and with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate and I will uh, leave the floor to uh, the remaining speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that was uh, quite efficient. Uh, and thank you for helping with the time management. I'm very relevant indeed. The World Economic Forum is always a reference um, uh, for us at the United Nations and I think for, I think for everyone uh, that thinks of leadership and how to move forward. Thank you for giving, uh, shedding some light there and for uh, giving us these resources. Very good. So last but not least, uh, and again, thanking her for, for her uh, flexibility. Let me now introduce uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Kirsten Todd, the Managing Director of the Cyber Readiness Institute, um, who will be uh, uh, talking to us on the vulnerabilities of small businesses and remote workers and online students. So I thank uh, Kirsten uh, for the, the effort that she's going to make. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Alex, and thanks very much to the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and to the Global Cyber Alliance uh, for sponsoring and hosting this uh, effective and, and thoughtful conversation. Uh, the advantage to being uh, toward the end is a lot of the great points have been made, so I will be efficient and hopefully trying to offer some new ones. And I've also seen some of the Q&A, so I will look to uh, integrate some of those questions into the presentation. If I could do next slide, please. So the Cyber Readiness Institute is a nonprofit effort uh, that was convened following uh, President Obama's independent commission on enhancing national cybersecurity. And the objective here was to convene senior leaders of global companies to come together and share their resources and best practices to create free content and tools for small businesses. So Amy, I'll be following up with you and your team on uh, these pro bono resources because the objective here obviously is that small businesses, individuals, local and state governments don't have the resources to invest in technology uh, and other elements of security for cyber. But when we look at cybersecurity, and this is so relevant right now for the pandemic, it's really about human behavior. Now uh, that is a key component to good security. And so what our tools do is we focus on human behavior. We focus on creating a culture of security recognizing that each individual has an accountability and a responsibility for cybersecurity. And by empowering individuals with that knowledge and information, every individual, every employee can contribute to the cybersecurity of the organization. Some of the companies involved with us are global companies um, that you see on the slide, ExxonMobil, MasterCard, Microsoft, and others. Again, the idea is uh, being able to support the small businesses and global value chains. Uh, next slide, please. Just quickly, as we look at how we've structured some of the remote work that we're doing, uh, we have our first primary tool with the Cyber Readiness Institute is the Cyber Readiness Program. And it focuses on four issues that are grounded in human behavior. So passwords, authentication, software updates, also known as patching, phishing, and USB use. And this becomes very relevant to the work that we've been doing uh, in the pandemic and helping small businesses. We also provide an incident response plan template uh, for small businesses to follow. And uh, on the right side of the slide, you'll see an outline of this program. But again, it really focuses on uh, being able to take an organization, whether it's five employees or 500, through a self-guided process to embed cybersecurity into the culture, teaching each employee about the value of passwords, uh, what, strong, what strong authentication looks like, Again, patching, phishing, and USB use. And this information has informed our work in the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So we have developed a series of guides when you look at the pandemic. Um, this, uh, I know we've been very serious today. I'll just, this is a little bit of humor, uh, just recognizing that the pandemic has really pushed everything online. And we've heard it in different formats with a lot of really important data. Um, both from the law side as well as uh, the, uh, the resource side around how things have pivoted, how cybercrime has really pivoted uh, online given the number of remote workers. Next slide, please. So one of the things the Cyber Readiness Institute has done, if you log on to our website, uh, which is also uh, bcyberready.com, we've created a series of guides for the pandemic. The guides are focusing on securing a remote workforce, a ransomware playbook, 
going to the cloud. Uh, we're about to publish one on a culture of security and data protection. And so these are some of the points that we've made today, but uh, obviously in, in uh, the pandemic, what is fascinating from a data perspective is that we have put just about every business online. So you think about the increase in uh, remote working, uh, the increase in capability, a large global company was talking to us about how uh, their VPN went down because part of when they were looking at some of the virtual personal networks, they were uh, critical components of this and what they were working on with their employees. The bandwidth issue is, is one that we've never faced before. So while new technologies are enabling us all to work remotely, uh, it also means that we've created a bigger land, a threat landscape. And so it becomes more critical now than ever to be hyper vigilant about uh, good, hyper good cyber hygiene practices. And so I just want to review a few of the issues that we've covered in our guides. Um, these are very much about how to help students, how to help small businesses, local and state governments, and individuals. And a lot of this is what you know, but what we're finding in our research and the work that we've done with the program, as well as the work that we've done in the research in the pandemic, is that these are the 80% uh, foundation. These solutions help to create that uh, strong foundation for every individual. So the first with passwords, we all know that the frontline defense for accessing critical data and application is how you access the data through authentication. So some of the key pieces that we're finding to resonate loudly with the audiences, again, small businesses, individuals, students, teachers, ensuring that your home router password is not easily guessed not putting uh, home address or personal names. And one of the basic elements to authentication is always enabling multi-factor authentication whenever possible. One of the elements and issues that has come up with a remote workforce has been the use of personal devices for professional reasons. And so obviously we encourage or discourage that use. Uh, but the other piece to this is also just remembering that if you're sharing a device to log out of your network with your business, when either a child or somebody else is using, uh, using the device. What's important to remember as we go through each of these is that to some of us who are in the space, it may sound very simple, but for those who have all gone remote and for people who have been in brick and mortar offices or who are not used to sharing these types of issues, these are the things that can help make a difference. The second piece is patching. Uh, we talk about this a lot for businesses just to uh, uh, be able to sign up for auto updates. Um, but this is really important as a small business to remind your employees to have their automatic to have their operating systems set to automatically update. This is again one of those very basic things, but it's also something you can take as an individual into your home environment uh, and to accept all the relevant security patches. One of the things that we're also talking to small businesses about and really any business is to be in touch with your workforce on a regular basis, whether it's weekly, whether it's daily and remind them of these security processes and procedures that you can take. Um, because as we get into this environment, we're often prioritizing ease right now because of the dislocation over security. And so workforces need to be encouraged and to need to, need to be constantly educated on what these basic steps are. Phishing, we've heard a lot about this today, but this really is one of the key pieces um, to what's going on right now in the workforce. Obviously, with more online activity, there, is more, there are more opportunities for an increase in online scams. Hackers and criminals are using people's curiosity, using people's fear, using the unknown to really ac to access networks and, and for phishing uh, attempts. And we are seeing an increase in that. Um, in the United States, we, there is a small business loan program that's being uh, distributed by the U.S. government. And there has been an enormous number of increased phishing attempts around that small business loan. So I think, Alex, as you mentioned early on, uh, the sadness here is we're seeing malicious actors prey on the vulnerabilities of those who are looking for more information, and particularly small businesses who are looking for these loans to know about the viability of their business. Anything that comes that looks even remotely similar, they're clicking on it. So the basics, again, that we're reminding people to look at is obviously hover over the sender's name to determine uh, if it's va uh, viable. We're also uh, recommending to companies to identify an individual within the organization who can be that repository when a ransomware is received or phishing email so that you're keeping up to date on what your business is seeing because obviously we want to be sharing information. 
and not to use social media apps for business communication. There are uh, business apps, there are business tools specifically designed for security and for business communications. And a lot of them are free. And so we're really encouraging business, businesses to step away from using social media apps designed rightly for entertainment and social media, but not designed for business use. And so to be able to take, uh, to take caution with that and how to uh, effectively use it. As we look to store and send data, the other piece to this is USB use. Um, it's critical, we, we highly discourage USBs, um, but if they have to be used to vet them. But fortunately now there are a lot of resources with the cloud that are inexpensive and they offer great file sharing and data protection services. So uh, using the cloud instead of a USB is one of a, a key element for small businesses to use. And finally, in this space, um, recognizing that social distancing works online too. With the increase in phishing, uh, we're encouraging individuals, students, teachers, small businesses to really limit the amount of personal data that you're sharing on social media uh, to reduce your threat landscape. It's, in, it's critical in this, in this time that we're paying closer attention to what we're revealing about ourselves so that it's not used against us uh, in any way. Top three sort of do's in this space, using separate passwords and pass phrases for your work and your personal email, updating software on all devices, using multi-factor authentication whenever possible, remembering not to click on links or attachments from emails from unknown senders. And even now, if you think you know the sender um, because of the opportunism and the uh, uh, opportunism and, and cleverness of malicious actors to click on those emails, don't send passwords or any type of in, uh, bank information by email. Use multi-factor authentication in these cases as well. In other words, pick up the phone and verify uh, anything that's regarding your financial uh, uh, viability and not to use USBs or public computers or Wi-Fi whenever possible. If we could go to the next slide and I'll be wrapping up shortly. When we look in uh, education, and I'll wait for the slide, um, uh, I've talked about these pieces around the devices and the connections. If we can go to the next slide, please. When we look at education right now, we have a new audience that's online and those are uh, teachers and we'll go to the next slide, please. Thank you. We're looking at teachers and students and a uh, couple of things that we're really imploring uh, teachers and students to, to recognize is that students are now online a lot more. So making them aware of uh, reducing their social media profile. Uh, and just three primary issues, um, authenticating the accounts used by students and teachers using pass phrases. So again, uh, limiting passwords and easy to, uh, to breach and to uh, compromise uh, authentication. Beware of phishing attempts and help your students verify that you're the sender of the email. So one of the things we're talking about is making a note in the subject line that is unique to a teacher so that students know that it's coming from them. And caution students only to use the video app um, if they see your screen name calling. So being careful and, and appropriate for that purpose. And I will just make a point that was raised by a couple of others. Um, cybersecurity education uh, is something that we have the opportunity to embed in schools at a young age. If we're giving students uh, computers at a young age to learn how to read and to do math, they should similarly be learning basics in cybersecurity. If we create a culture by in integrating into the education system. And so one of the, the uh, silver linings to the pandemic is an opportunity to educate everybody on cybersecurity. We have the broadest audience paying attention to their remote work environment, to their remote learning environment. And we need to use this as an opportunity to educate everybody. And I believe that's the last slide, um, but I'll just go to the next one to make sure that all other elements have been, uh, have been addressed. But again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. Certainly look forward to the question and answer. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with everyone with a common mission to secure uh, not just communities and small businesses, but schools, uh, students, teachers, educators, uh, states and countries globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kirsten. Uh, thank you for calling our attention to uh, this very uh, specific and practical um, uh, advice, uh, pieces of advice that you have given us. And, and particularly, uh, I invite everyone to, to visit you online and uh, read about what uh, your institute is doing. Uh, so uh, thanks to Kirsten from the Cyber Readiness Institute.
and thanks to all the speakers so far. We are um, now out of time, but we have to hear the last component, uh, and it's an important one. I kindly uh, I give the floor now to Phil Reitinger, the President and CEO of the Global Cyber Alliance, who will wrap up. Phil, please. Can you hear us? Phil? Thank you, Alex. Sorry. Uh, operator error in that case. Um, I will be extremely brief given that we've gone very long. We've heard a lot today about how threat, vulnerability, and consequence have all gone up in the COVID-19 epidemic. With everybody working from home, we have much more significant risks. Um, what I'd like to briefly emphasize to everybody is that all is not lost. There are some very simple things, as Kirsten was just talking about, that everyone can do to make themselves more secure. And there are resources, as Amy Jordan mentioned before, that are available for people to be more secure, to take a few simple steps and be more secure. So I wanted to just highlight a couple of things that my organization and our partners, the Global Cyber Alliance, uh, have done um, in order to make things more usable. Um, the first tool that I like to point out to people is the GCA Cybersecurity Toolkit for Small Business. So this is a toolkit that's designed for small business to go through and implement basic cyber hygiene. So it's there is video training in it. Um, all of the the tool the uh, the instructions are are fit into six fairly simple toolboxes, um, and so it is a a real opportunity for a small business to go in and do something concrete. Two things to highlight. One, the tool, box, the tool kit, the cybersecurity toolkit is free and all the tools in the toolkit are free. Um, it is available in four native languages. So if you look in the upper right hand corner, you'll see um, a US flag, a French flag, a Spanish flag and a German flag. That's because the toolkit and all the videos in it are natively available in English, Spanish, French or English, French, Spanish, and German to go in the order of the flags. Um, and this is designed to be something that is doable by just about anyone. So I'd urge people to give it a try. The second thing I wanted to highlight was the work from home effort that GCA had launched with a coalition of other nonprofits. So the Cybersecurity Toolkit is really about there's a lot of good guidance out there for small businesses. How do you get them to actually do something? We had a question in the, in the Q&A box about usability of security tools. So we're trying to get around that by giving people not just, a, uh, not just guidance, but a cookbook and a kitchen to do what they need to do. Very simply, sort of do the Master Chef Junior version of cybersecurity. The second thing is we and our partners recognizing that in this COVID environment, as Kirsten was saying, we've got not only work from home, we've got learn from home. We've got to get people to do some very basic things. So we and a group of, of 23 nonprofits total, including both um, the Cyber Resilience Institute who's on this call and the World Economic Forum Center for Cybersecurity have joined together and, and focused on providing active free tools and advice to people to do three very simple things to really reduce their cybersecurity risk. And this is the, um, the workfromhome.globalcyberalliance.org site. So again, that's workfromhome.globalcyberalliance.org site. Um, and you can see all of the partners there. The three things to do are, as Kirsten said, patch your systems, to use something other than just passwords, use multi-factor authentication, and the third item is to use a protective DNS service, something that most people don't know about, but with 30 seconds, literally 30 seconds of work, you can significantly cut your risk simply by turning on a free service that's available anywhere around the world and using that to block phishing attempts and access to malicious sites. So right there you see the landing page for the work from home. Again, you know, we're all in a difficult situation. There's nothing that most of the people on this call can do to actually lessen the pandemic. What we can do, what we can all do, and what everybody listening can do is take active measures to make 
us more secure to be able to work through this environment. And so going back to what I said at the start, cybersecurity is a fundamental human right. Um, we're all working to give you the mechanisms to be able to provide that human right to anyone around the world, no matter what ethnic group they're in, what country or region they live in, or what their economic status is. And so tools are available, use them, and we in the Global Cyber Alliance, the Cyber Resilience Institute, Siemens, Unitar, um, the World Economic Forum, we're all there to help. We're all working together on this and give you real means and of course, the district attorney's office to help protect you online. We're all working together to implement real means to protect people. So I, I, I thank everybody for listening. Point out the resources, gcatoolkit.org and workfromhome.globalcyberalliance.org. And at FYI, if you look at those, you'll see pointers to the CRI tools, which are really awesome as well. Um, and so um, thanks again, Alex, for putting this together. Absolutely, Phil, and uh, thank you not only to you, but to all the speakers. We normally have two hours for this uh, webinar, but it's been so interesting that now it's uh, two hours and five minutes, two hours and seven minutes. Uh, but still, let me add in, in 60 seconds or so the following, because I believe it's important. And unfortunately, we don't have the time that we would like to have to address the questions, but I, I, would, least, I would like to at least read three of the questions, comments that we have received, and then we wrap up. Uh, uh, from someone in Asia, it, it, he or she says, being a normal person, we look forward to the policies maintained by a website on their security features, but we are unable to check their practical implementation. So, uh, as we have seen recently, some video conferencing tools uh, came to the line line for, uh, you know, having weak security and so on. But if you look forward to new tools for video meetings, how can we be able to check the data privacy and the security features of those platforms? It's very interesting because we really don't know. There is a degree of trust amongst the users, any citizen in any condition, depending on a global conferencing platform like this one. And I happen to think that Zoom is excellent and marvelous, but indeed, you should never have a meeting without a password and authentication and so on and so forth. So there are vulnerabilities. The second one, quite interesting as well, it's about cyberbullying. Um, he or she says uh, cyberbullying is a big problem among children as well as for adults. Thank you for what you have shared. How can a person uh, combat this appropriately? Where can one get the copy of the book protecting children from cyberbullying? That indeed is something that you can get. Um, uh, I mean, uh, one of the speakers mentioned it and you saw even an image. We can't, um, if you write to us, if you are listening and you write to the email, that you got after the, with the invitation, we will be very happy to point uh, 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 to the information that you need to get that uh, book on cyberbullying. And last but not least, the comment is as follows. So cybersecurity laws around the world can have negative impact on human rights, very much indeed. What do we need to be aware of, especially in a crisis situation? And um, we will also invite you um, uh, to send us your email and we can uh, direct you in this case uh, to Dr. Pavan Dugal, who is, as uh, you saw before, a very prolific author and a, a scholar on these things because there is always this dichotomy. Uh, when the government needs to protect the, its population, how far can they go and how many human rights uh, can be diminished perhaps uh, in that quest. So you see uh, several uh, comments, questions uh, that actually put in perspective what we have been discussing here and ratify what we say at the beginning and we have consistently say uh, from the point of view of all the speakers, cyber security is a very, very important fact of life and the vulnerability behind it and the resilience behind it. So we simply encourage you uh, to use some of the practical tools that you have heard here today to go visit the websites and the platforms that the speakers have mentioned. And with that, on behalf of the United Nations and UNITAR and all the other organizers, I simply thank you for listening to us today. I wish you the best. Blessings. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.